Okay, welcome. Thank you all for coming out this evening. Nice hot summer evening, uh, but we get to meet in this beautiful meeting house. And we want to thank Dietrich right here, the clerk of the Woodbury Friends Meeting House, for making this wonderful room and this beautiful building available to us. Thank you. So um, we're really happy to see you tonight because we have a lot of information that we'd like to share with you. Um, one thing we'd like to say just in terms of housekeeping is make sure you did sign in in the sign-in sheet. That's important so we know uh, who's here. And please put down your contact information so we can let you know when new stuff comes up that we, we can share with you if you're interested in this issue. So um, I'm not a scientist. I'm not a lawyer. I'm an environmental advocate. My name is Tracy Carluccio, and I'm Deputy Director of Delaware Riverkeeper Network. And I'm here tonight with residents of the community who are very concerned about the problem of per and polyfluorinated chemicals that are, have been released into the environment in the region here. So first I'm going to go, before we go to a, to a, a, a video that we're gonna show, first I'm going to um, just give you a quick history of why we're here and how, sort of how we got here. Um, back in 2013, it was discovered by Delaware Riverkeeper Network through um, and Freedom of Information. They, in New Jersey, they call them Open Records Act uh, request. And we got files that showed that there were high levels of PFAS compounds in New Jersey. And they had tested in several places and there were, uh, they found it in several places. And the highest amount that was found of any PFAS compound anywhere in New Jersey was in Paulsboro. And it was for a compound, which I'm going to give you the acronym for, PFNA. The full names are in the handouts that you have. So PFNA was released by the Solvay facility in West Deptford for many years. We found that out as we went along and connected the dots. They actually had a patent for a chemical um, that they used in processing the plastic coatings that they put on uh, different products. So that use of PFNA, and then it turned out also PFOA, uh, that they used was released into the environment. And one of the things that's important for us to understand is that PFAS compounds are not just any uh, hazardous material. And there are dangers with every hazardous material. But the problem with PFAS compounds is that they don't break down in the environment. So they're highly toxic, and studies show that they are actually connected to health, adverse health conditions, including cancers. And PFNA itself also compromises the immune system. One of the most dangerous properties of these, pro of these products is that it actually affects the developmental ability of the fetus in the womb, of infants, and young children. So we're talking about our most vulnerable populations, those who are, who are drinking water from a formula as an infant or uh, breastfeeding as an infant, and young children who are most affected because per body weight they drink more water than anyone else. And then we're also talking about those with immune deficiencies and other uh, health problems that are particularly susceptible to the health effects of PFAS compounds. Because they don't break down in the environment, they're very popular as coatings. It makes the plastic very dur durable. And one of the properties that then transfers over to a person who's drinking water that has PFAS in it is that it also does not break down in your body. Your body has a very difficult time excreting it. So as it builds up in the environment because it doesn't break down, it also builds up in your body. And that's why drinking water with even very tiny amounts of PFNA or PFOA in it um, and other PFAS compounds in it um, is highly dangerous because it builds up to toxic levels in your body. So um, when we found this out in 2013, uh, five municipalities and it, it, 
uh, up to 60,000 people were affected right away because uh, water emergencies were declared in the municipalities around the Solvay facility. That includes Woodbury, Greenwich Township, East Greenwich, Paulsboro, um, and then you know, we also knew, know that the, as a result, and West Deptford, of course, which is the location of the Solvay facility. Um, we know that uh, it travels by groundwater and by surface water, um, and that the, this PFNA and other PFAS compounds were released um, through various means to the environment. And in the handout that looks like this, If you didn't get one, I think Jim would be able to get you one. Just raise your hand. But in this handout, we explain what they are. We talk about how they build up in your blood and your body. And then we talk about the health effects. And those are not only from scientific studies. Uh, they're also, it's also from data that has been collected from human health. Um, that is, blood studies that have been done in West Virginia, where they first discovered the PFAS compounds when a lawyer down there pursued a case against DuPont, which is also one of the, uh, one of the, um, thank you, Jean, uh, which is also uh, one of the sources of contamination in New Jersey and nationally. Uh, 3M is another one. Um, so, tonight, um, if you look at your handout, you'll see Solvay in West Deptford. And there was a lawsuit that was filed in November of 2020 by the state of New Jersey against Solvay and Arkema, which is related to them, um, because they were not getting the progress that they wanted from Solvay and answering questions and cooperating with them in order to put together a work plan for cleaning up the site and for investigating exactly where all these po the pollutant uh, had pollutants had moved. Where had the PFNA and the PFOA and the other pollutants from the facility moved through the groundwater and through surface water? We know because studies have been done by the state and also by the Delaware River Basin Commission that it is in the river. We know that it's in streams. We know it's in fish flesh. And we know it's also in people's groundwater who have private wells and then also in municipal uh, uh, and uh, local um, water systems. Now, all of the, the communities here in this region have put treatment systems in in order to remove the original problem, PFNA. And there were regulatory actions taken by DEP as a result of the municipalities and the public screaming back in 2013 to say, you got to get this stuff out of our drinking water and you got to clean it up at its source. So the result of that took several years and a lot of pushing by the public. But New Jersey DEP was the first state in the United States to adopt a safe drinking water standard, which requires the removal of PFNA from drinking water. And the reason for that was because of what happened here. Because it was found here, and it was found but when DEP did the research to be the highest level anywhere in the world that had been recorded at that time. And PFNA was the first PFAS compound to get for any state to adopt a safe drinking water standard or what they call a maximum contaminant level for. And then following that, and that, that was uh, uh, adopted back in 2018, but then in 2020, PFOA and PFOS, you may have heard of PFOS, that's related mainly to firefighting foams and it released at military facilities and also some airports and facilities like that, um, fire training schools. Um, that, that problem um, from uh, the use of firefighting foam uh, led to the, the basically uncontrolled release of PFOS into the environment. And um, in January of this year, New Jersey DEP filed a lawsuit against the United States because the Department of Defense is not cooperating fully to require the cleanup and the identification of the pollution in New Jersey. So um, I want you to also look at this page on that handout. And again, if you don't have it, Jim or, Mar or Jean, 
uh, will get it for you. But this, this right at the top here is from the Solvay submission to the United States Environmental Protection Agency disclosing to them how much uh, PFNA they were releasing into the environment. Now this year, this was, this was the year um, 2015. And if you just look at that for a minute, you see where it says product 3 to 10 percent? What that means is the use of the, this uh, PFNA in their processing there ended up with 3 to 10 percent going into the product. Everything else went into the environment. It went into the air. You can see the air amount. It went into the wastewater. And that means that it went into us. It went into the people living in the area. It also means it went into the soil. It went into vegetation. It went into any receptor, they call it, um, in the region. And because of that, uh, they were required to phase out under a stewardship program the use of PFNA. And they did that. They did that um, back in 2010. And I'm, we're going to be talking a little bit more um, about what that means um, in terms of what they replaced that with. But before we do that, I just want to put on a video here because we're going to hear from some people who live in the area who've been looking into this problem. And they're going to express to you what their concerns are and what they've been finding in the research that they've been doing on their home computers, basically. So I'm going to put that on right now. We're going to listen to them. It's under 15 minutes. And then we're going to come back and we'll pick up from there. I'd like to introduce to you uh, some of the people who are experiencing um, the, the problems that we all um, are talking about here tonight. And those folks, as I said in the beginning, are Marilyn Quinn, Jim Stewart, and Gina Cabola. But we're going to start and just hear um, some thoughts uh, from each of them. And we're going to start with Marilyn Quinn. And Marilyn is from West Deptford. She serves on her environmental commission. Um, and she's going to tell you what her concerns are. So Marilyn, go ahead. Okay, can you hear me? Okay, uh, yes. Uh, my name is Marilyn Quinn, and I'm living with a clear view of Solvay specialty polymers from my sunroom window in the back of my home in West Deptford, New Jersey. These uh, per and polyfluoroalkyl chemicals, the PFAS or PFAS, have been pouring into your environment and mine for decades. They are also in many products you and I have been using. And now the replacement chemical, the so-called, which I can't really say, CLIPFICA, which is a very long acronym, uh, which has only recently been revealed through legal action, uh, but not willingly by Solvay, is known to be just as toxic, if not more toxic. Their own company studies had been withheld once again. Solvay has sued companies that develop tests for these chemicals. I re read recently of one. Now they are promising to end using these latest chemicals in June. They say they are investing in new technologies completely unlike the forever chemical hazards that have enriched them, but can we trust them? When I moved here back in 2004, I did not know what Solvay's business was. And I did not know about the dangers of the chemicals. It was discharging into water. And we now know they are discharging this stuff into the air, the soil. It goes into the sediment and the fish. And as a retired university librarian, I research and delve into issues that concern me. This issue has been the subject of academic journals, local, national, and international reports, and many nonprofit and scientific organizations. I have a huge folder. I have been happy that our current township government has been addressing the contamination of our drinking water sources as best as they can. There is testing of our drinking water, which is now required, and residents get a full report every year. The township has promised to keep abreast of the science behind the testing and the purification of our water. 
but they can only go as far as what is known about these chemicals. And they depend on the Federal Environmental Protection Agency and the New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection, which have struggled to find out the nature of the chemicals. Much information was hidden by political appointees at the EPA over the last four years, which is hard to believe. And I just find it appalling. Uh, these toxins are not limited to my township. They are in all of your townships, flowing in the streams and rivers into wells and blowing well beyond the factories. Solve is not the only perpetrator, but it is a big one. Other companies have been doing the same with the same kind of chemicals, Chemours, DuPont, Arkema, 3M, and Honeywell. The new Biden administration is actively working on the issue. Uh, there was actually in 2019, somebody passed something called the PFAS Action Plan, but it was stripped in Congress and, uh, because it, in spite of the bipartisan support, because of the industrial lobbyists and the political donations that go on. Over the last decade, these lobbyist and political donations have influenced legislation and have weakened and prevented regulations and let com companies such as Solve produce and discharge these chemicals. But the science is now becoming more available, which will encourage legal action for the damage that has been done. I want the public to know what companies like Solve um, have done. These dangerous chemicals stay in the environment. They do not go away and Solve has known this. They do not go away. They have reimbursed my township for some of the water remediation, but they have affected people all over and should be liable, not just for the damages done to the bodies of people who drink the water, but those who use the end products, such as firefighting foam, take out containers for your fast food, um, rain resistant clothing, uh, not to mention uh, liable for testing and helping to return our soil and our water and rivers, you know, back to some kind of normalcy. Uh, this is where we get our vegetables, our fruits, our fish, and so much more. I asked Solve to test my garden soil. I'm an avid gardener. And as I said, I only live actually less than half a mile from this plant. Um, I asked Solve to test the soil. They said they could not test it, which I believe is false. They owe all of us and should pay for the costs of testing and remediation. The health effects are definitely widespread and disturbing. I follow reporting in American and in international news and science resources. I mean, when you read in Britain and Germany and all over about West Deptford and Solve, you know this is serious here. So I ask, did my brother-in-law's kidney cancer come from all this? Is my sudden spike in cholesterol a result? I never had this before. <laughs> Will it affect my immune response to vaccines? All of these ailments and many more have been associated with such chemicals in studies by independent scientists. Can we ever hope that our government can assure us that industry is not poisoning our future and that such injury is criminal? How much money will it take to help heal the injury to our health and to the natural world? How much of your money, my money, and your children's money will our communities demand action? That's what I want to find out. So. Thank you. Obviously, Marilyn. I'm quite angry. <laughs> Thank you, Marilyn. If anyone has questions for Marilyn, please type them into the Q&A. Uh, if you're if you joined a little late after our uh, beginning, um, put any question that you have into the Q and A box so we can see it and we'll we'll um, answer it as best we can. Um, and then uh, after our Q and A session, we will be sending a link to this recording out to everybody. And if we, there are any other questions that we missed or uh, that were accidentally put into the chat, for instance, we'll try to answer those as well. And if you join late before I said so, please introduce yourself in the chat and say where you're from. We'd like to know where people are from who joined us. So our second speaker here tonight uh, is our panelist, Jim Stewart. And James Stewart is from National Park, and he's gonna make some remarks. 
Thank you, Jim. Thank you. Thank you, Tracy. Uh, from La you may not know where National Park is. It's only a one square mile town uh, surrounded by West Deptford, right on the Delaware River. Uh, we're like uh, two miles north of the Solvay plant. So uh, we're in the red zone. I've lived here for over 30 years. Before retiring as an architect, my primary job was writing construction specifications. Because of that, I was familiar with Solvay. They and their predecessor companies were manufacturers of a resin for architectural coatings, which are used to finish aluminum curtain wall and other building components. Although the product was safe after application, its manufacture has possibly resulting, resulted in contamination of soil and subsurface water in the surrounding area, according to the New Jersey DEP. I have collected, I have a collection of National Park water quality reports that are issued quarterly. Each one indicates that our water has consistently violated the state's drinking water standard for PFNA, which is 13 parts per trillion. I commend our mayor and council for staying on top of this problem and keeping the residents informed of the progress to get New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection to approve an application to acquire the need to filtration system to protect our water from this contaminant. I am concerned, however, about how long it took the NJDEP approval. Approval has taken over six months and financing through the New Jersey Infrastructure Bank is yet to be finalized. I am also concerned that residents who have a severely compromised immune system or who are pregnant, have an infant, or are elderly are at an increased risk and are being asked to seek advice from their healthcare providers about drinking this water. There are, they are also being told there is a household carbon filter that could be purchased. The recommended, the recommended carbon filters with National Science Foundation certification primarily filter PFOA and PFOS chemicals. To better filter PFNA chemicals, a carbon filter should be combined with a reverse osmosis filter. However, they are very expensive. Unfortunately, there apparently are no funds available to cover these costs. I've had health problems of the types listed as being a result of long-term exposure to these chemicals. Unfortunately, it remains very difficult to prove a causation. I hope that this contamination can be corrected and soon I hope that these found those found responsible for this contamination be held responsible for all the costs associated with its remediation. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. I greatly appreciate it. So our last speaker uh, tonight is Gina Carolla. And Gina is a 38 year resident of West Stepford. Um, she is going to be making um, comments here tonight and thank you, Gina, for joining us. Okay. Thank you, Tracy. Um, like Tracy said, I was I lived in West Stepford for 38 years. Uh, lived in National Park prior to that, and um, I'm glad to hear Marilyn say that uh, West Stepford's uh, town council is now addressing this issue because when this whole issue of the PFOAs came to light, uh, maybe. Well, was it Tracy 10 years ago or so I started attending the environmental commission meetings when I was living there and at that point the council the mayor and council was sweeping it under the rug they did not want people to know about it uh, don't know why but that's what they did and um, but people found out so they had to address it um, I can't say that I've suffered any health problems but um, I was kind of hoping to move back to West Stepford soon. I just had a realtor in to look up my place, but it's probably going to depend on what comes out of this, these new chemicals. Um, um, I'm not sure I want to live there if I'm going to have to worry about my drinking water being polluted. So um, currently I am, well, I have been for many years, the um, Sierra, New Jersey Sierra Club's 
uh, liaison to the Delaware, uh, I'm the Delaware River issue coordinator. So I've worked with Tracy on a lot of different things. Uh, so I'm very interested in this issue and I wanna help keep people informed. Thank you, Gina. Appreciate your comments. We have to ask the questions. Are they going to disclose exactly what are the toxic properties of these new chemicals? Uh, do they have toxic properties? How do they affect the human body? Do they affect wildlife? Are they moved through the air and the water? Are they easily transported? How are they going to manufacture them? How much of the, act of the product is actually going to go into the plastics and the coatings that they create? And how much is going to go into the environment? Are they going to be safe? That's the big question. Or are they also going to have health effects? It's a little hard for people to trust them and believe that these are safe when they, when they found out that they've been tricked, essentially, by the replacement compounds. So yes, they need to replace the toxic replacements, just like they needed to replace PFNA. We don't, uh, we can't tolerate having toxic compounds in our drinking water. They don't belong there and they must be removed. And the sources of that contamination must be cleaned up. But whether or not these replacements uh, for the replacements are gonna be good for the community and our uh, human health and, and our wildlife and environment um, remains to be seen. We wanna know, is Solve gonna completely disclose right now everything before they start using these new products? And if they have used these products in the past, then give us right now the studies that have been done to prove that they're safe. Um, and so, mainly wanted to let everyone know that not only do we have the replacements, but now we have replacements for the replacements. It's gotten more complicated, but the same issue remains. We don't want toxic materials in our drinking water, in our soil, in the vegetables that we grow in our backyards, and the fish that we take from the streams around here. Uh, we don't want it in our air. We don't want it in, our, in the consumer products where people also get exposed to it, but we want Solve to stop releasing it and to clean up the source of the pollution so they are no longer a liability for the people of New Jersey. Uh, I hope you caught what the speakers were saying. Um, Marilyn is here, Marilyn Quinn. Um, also, Jim Stewart is here. Gina Carolla is out of town tonight, uh, but they're here to chat a little bit afterwards. Um, to talk about uh, the, what they talked about. So I'm sorry that you could not hear all of it, but I think you could hear the speakers better than me. Is that right? Yeah. You can, okay, great. So going back to this handout that I mentioned before, I want to pick up on this third page, which is the second of the two-sided four-page handout, and you see a science article there. It says non-targeted mass spectral detection and has a long name. That's the name that Marilyn mentioned. It's basically chloro perfluoro polyether carboxylate. How, how is that for a mouthful? But what that long name means is it is actually a PFAS compound. It is a replacement for PFNA and it was approved for use by the EPA, but it is actually a fluorinated compound. So what has happened is when Solve replaced the PFNA they, in their manufacturing processes, they replaced it with that long jargon name. And there was very little information available about it at the time. As a matter of fact, Solve kept a lot of information secret from the public and even avoided handing in studies to EPA that they should have handed in in order to get this replacement compound, what's called Solve's replacement, approved. So through subterfuge, they went ahead and got their okay to use this replacement compound. And it wasn't until New Jersey DEP scientists and scientists from a lab at the Environmental Protection Agency started looking into these replacement compounds. Because EPA had required that PFAS compounds be phased out of use, and they were all phased out of use by major manufacturers, 
uh, not overseas, just in the United States and only the major manufacturers. When they were phased out, they had to be replaced with something. And so these replacements were lickety split approved by the EPA. They were, uh, they had put their applications in and they were approved. Um, within about two years, they approved 300 of these replacement compounds. And they were supposed to be handing in any kind of materials, any kind of studies, any kind of worker studies, blood studies, any information about whether or not this replacement compound was toxic, had health effects, or was persistent in the environment. And they did not hand all that information in. E shame on EPA. They should have looked harder. They should have put their feet to the fire. So they're not off the hook either. But these replacement compounds now have been used here in this region by Solvay and the study that was done by EPA, which you see this, the name of there, and then the link to it in Science Magazine. And in the other handout, there's also the link to the Environmental Science and Technology paper, which was a follow-up. That's this other handout. Make sure you get it. A lot of links in there. And that... That second science study. What is the title at the top of the page? Uh, it says links to more information. The handout is this here. Maybe Jean can help you if you didn't get it. Thank you, Jean. So both of these studies came out and it was like a bombshell because nobody knew about these replacement compounds and they didn't know that they were being released into the environment. And what happened is these scientists went out and sampled. Now, it was very difficult for them to figure out even how to sample for this. There's no EPA-accepted method yet. And Solvay was keeping secret how to act, the, the information they actually needed, the scientific information, in order to figure out how to test for it in the environment. But by doing a lot of uh, detective work, basically, forensic analysis, the Environmental Protection Agency and DEP scientists backward analyzed it, and they found that this replacement compound was actually in the soil in the science study that's discussed, Science Magazine study. In the other study, it was also found in the water. It was found not only in surface water, but in groundwater. It was even found in wells in West Deptford that are used for private water supplies. So we know that this stuff has gotten into the environment. Now, the scariest part of all of this is studies show that this is actually a more toxic compound than PFNA. That is, it has a, a similar half-life, but it has more carbon chains, so it's a stronger bond, and it's more difficult to break down. So we're very concerned, and there's, very, there's really very little information beyond what I'm telling you right now and what is in these studies that you can get. But we're very concerned because what's the major issue that pops into your mind? Does the water system that my town use remove it? And how do I get it out of my drinking water if I have a private well? Well, we don't really know the answer to that yet. I do know just from public information that New Jersey DEP is trying to develop a method in order to be able to set a standard at least to begin searching for this in a big way in the environment because what they did was you know one sample at a time and they did a very few samples but rest assured something has to happen and because Solve is in the process of cleaning up the pollution from PFNA, we believe that this new replacement compound must be added to that cleanup program. It has to be detected. We have to find out where it is. We have to find out, is it in people's bodies? We have to find out, is it toxic? What are the health effects? And we believe that in order to do that, we have to do what we did back in 2013 and 2014. We have to shout from the rooftops that we want the information in order to be able to protect ourselves from toxins in our water. And one thing that is a, a great opportunity right now is on the last page of this handout. <clears throat> so we actually have an upcoming opportunity to make noise about this. And that's because Solvay has taken years 
going back and forth, quibbling with DEP about what are the limits of what they have to clean up, what they have to test, what sort of what they call environmental media, what soils, what sediments, fish, surface water, ponds, groundwater, what do they actually have to test? How far out from the facility do they have to go? And PFNA has been found in some odd places, we think because of sludge from the Gloucester County Municipal Utility Authority, which has been laid on farm fields in South Jersey. So it goes pretty far. Um, this is the original PFNA. And th that, that cleanup has been going back and forth. Delaware Riverkeeper Network, my organization, did hire a specialist to comment on one of the earlier work plans, and we felt they were being very limited, Solvay was, in what they wanted to do, and DEP has been pushing them. So it's almost completed. And in order to complete this, they have to have a public information program. And they have to have a way for the public to ask questions and get information and give their input into how this cleanup program is going to go. So on this last page, I want to point out, it says what they have to do. They have to disseminate information. They have, to, uh, they sit, they have committed to have an information website. They have to uh, receive information. They say they're, they're going to be setting up a phone information line and also an email where people can ask questions. So at the top, you can see what they have to do. But if you move down that sheet there, in bold it says, the department shall hold a public hearing on the discharge to groundwater proposal if the department determines that there is a significant degree of public interest in favor of holding a public hearing. So to me, that's an opening for us we can ask for a public hearing, and we can ask for more than one. I mean, after all, look at all the municipalities that are affected. A lot of municipalities, it's not just West Stepford or Woodbury, it's 60,000 people at least. And according to these studies that were done, that is in the Science Magazine and, and the uh, Environmental Science and Technology Journal, it has moved, this replacement compound moved by air as well. So it's actually acting a little differently. They even found it on the far northeastern corner of New Jersey, where they did a random sample just to see how far did it travel by air. And it got all the way up there. Um, they even found it in New Hampshire, of all things. And remember, this is called Solvay's replacement. It's only being used by Solvay. So they can't point the finger at anyone else. And they did a test where the air uh, patterns do not move down in Georgia, and they didn't find it at all. So we believe that we are on good grounds here to insist that there be public meetings, public hearings, and it's not just going to be Solve doing, excuse my expression, a dog and pony show. We believe that, um, that Solve needs to have the public at this meeting asking hard questions, and the only way we can ask those hard questions is to be informed. That's why we're having this meeting here tonight. We'll have more meetings. We'll go anybody, anywhere anybody wants us to come. Um, you know, small meetings, big meetings, in order to inform people so they'll be able to ask informed questions. Now, New Jersey DEP must be at any public meeting they have. And that's so they can't really just have a show. Um, so, so we know that that is required. It's in the regulations. If you want to get go into those details, you can dig deep by reading those regulations. So that's, that's our story. Um, we believe that there has been a, a terrible irony here where the people who are most hurt by PFNA have now been hurt again by a replacement compound. The next chapter in this is that there is a replacement for the replacement. And like I said in that there, I, I don't want to make it more complicated, but because of all this noise that was made by uh, EPA and New Jersey DEP through these science articles, it was like a flash, uh, and, and Solve has pulled back using these fluorinated compounds. And they say they have the, the new products that they're going to be using are non-fluorinated compounds. What we are saying and what I was saying in that 
piece right there and that we think we should be saying to Solve at a public meeting is, what about these chemicals? You know, we did, you told us and we believed you that you were phasing out the dangerous PFNA and everything was safe now, and that was wrong. Now you're phasing out this replacement compound. What are you replacing it with? I mean, why shouldn't Solvay just put a pause on any kind of manufacturing until they can safely operate their facility? But we want to have Solvay address this new compound as well to show are there toxicity studies? Does it go into the environment? Um, is it persistent? Is it bioaccumulative? And is it toxic? Those are the three things that EPA looks at. So um, at this point, I want to just, uh, we're going to go into questions and answers. And I want to give just a minute uh, because we have the township, township admin, the city administrator from Woodbury here, Bill Fleming. And Bill, is going to, just a couple minutes, give us a quick update about what is being done in West Deptford for the PFNA. Um, it's his town, uh, and they welcomed us here. So I thought it would be good if he could just, for anybody who lives in Woodbury, if you want to know what is the filtration system. Um, Bill, would you just give us a, a couple minutes? Could you stand up? Yeah. I'm not administrator, I'm sorry. Town councilman. But I'm also uh, an environmental engineer and a uh, geologist, and uh, I've been following this issue uh, since uh, Sade came to us back in about 2013 with a request to sample our, our wells. I think as Tra Tracy uh, mentioned, um, the Riverkeeper had actually gone through the data that EPA had required uh, for new. Uh, communities to sample for, for new and emerging contaminants, and found the PFNA was part of that uh, data set. And uh, most of the rest of us weren't aware of it, at least until uh, Sale came and knocked on our door. Sale probably sampled for a couple of two or three years. We let them sample. Uh, we have two wells at Red Bank, uh, right by the YMCA. Uh, the first one became contaminated. We, we noticed the contamination in the first one almost uh, right away when they started sampling at pretty low levels, um, but nonetheless increasing. Um, so we turned it off uh, immediately, and we started to use our second well at Red Bank, which is a little <coughs> further uh, down gradient and e uh, to the east. Uh, and uh, once we started to use that, we got about a year out of it before the levels in that well also reached um, uh, levels in excess of what we wanted to send out into our drinking water system. There was no MCL at that point in time. Um, so we shut that one off too. And we um, lived for the, la for the last four years or so uh, um, without the use of that uh, uh, water supply. Um, fortunately, didn't have a problem. Uh, we have three other wells, um, two uh, of them down in Sewell, um, on your way um, down Woodbury Glassboro Road, and the other one uh, in Woodbury, a kind of centrally located, uh, we call it the Railroad Avenue Well, that's well nine. Um, but uh, those three wells are in the lower PRM. Here in Aquifer is the problem, um, and it has uh, an upper, a middle, and a lower level. Most of the water supply in the Tri-County area is in the, that um, comes from the PRM Aquifer, is either in the upper or the lower PRM uh, Aquifer. Um, there are clay layers between these, these uh, levels, and I believe that's why we haven't found it in the lower the wells that are screened in the, in the lower uh, levels. Um, but at any rate, to make a long story short, um, we built a carbon filtration plant, um, spent uh, well over a million dollars uh, on that, um, had to go through the DEP approval process, the process we used the New Jersey Infrastructure Trust to fund it, and um, we put that plant online back in March. Um, and we have uh, non-detect levels in our water um, for PFNA at this point in time. Um, started and have started to use uh, wells um, seven and eight um, <coughs> as, we're, as we speak. So. And uh, do we have any questions that have been written down? Yeah. 
if we could pass them up here, that would be great. Bill, thank you very much. And uh, I'm sorry, Township Committee person. He's an elected representative. So thank you for coming out and sharing that this evening. Okay, any questions um, from anybody that have been written down? Yeah, I have one from uh, Lauren Stahl. Uh, she asked, which municipalities are affected and which are safe? Well, we only know um, what the results of the sampling shows us, because you really don't know if you have it in your water unless they sample for it. And um, as Bill said in, in Woodbury, um, they, they're de they have non-detect for PFNA. Um, and those towns that have installed granular activated carbon are supposed to be below 13 parts per trillion for PFNA, which is the standard that was set by DEP. For PFOA, it's 14 parts per trillion. And for PFOS, it's 13 parts per trillion. So you get these reports in your water uh, bills. And those reports tell you what the uh, results are. If, those, if you're, the results that, like Jim had mentioned um, in his talk on the video, are above that, they, they have to um, fix the problem. And either that means installing, um, you know, maybe they didn't clean the GAC filters, maybe they don't have a complete system yet, maybe they're blending water that is treated with water that isn't in order to get it below 13 and it went above it. I mean, there's a lot of different reasons it could be above 13 parts per trillion, but the law says they have to remove it. So on an annual basis, you get these reports if it, there has not been any detection at all that has gone above these standards. But, so you get an annual report. But if, you ha if the town has had a breakthrough then they have to do quarterly reports. So make sure you look at your bills because that will tell you if there's been any breakthrough above the safe drinking water standards that have been adopted by DEP. Now I have to tell you, a lot of people are concerned because um, any amount of PFAS can have an impact on your health. And Delaware Riverkeeper Network hired a toxicologist um, we, uh, a firm that does this kind of risk assessment. And they said that the standard should be, for these chemicals should be lower, single digits between one and five or six, depending on which compound you're talking about. Now, most of these uh, compounds uh, can be measured down to a, pretty much a detect level, like one, two, or three at the labs in New Jersey, parts per trillion. So, you know, when you're down at like four or three parts per trillion, you might show non-detect. And that means that it's as low as they can detect through the laboratory that they're using. And that is really the only, and so I can say that many people who have even tap water want to put in filtration in order to get it completely to non-detect. Now, Woodbury has non-detect on PFNA. Um, I know that Paulsboro had non-detect last time I checked. Um, but each person should really check with their own municipality to find out, is it non-detect? And remember, it can fluctuate. So if you want to be absolutely safe, like our attorney at our office, for instance, his wife was pregnant, and um, they put in, uh, you know, they bit the bullet and spent the money and put in a home filtration system, even though their water was coming from a municipal system and it was treated. So that's really a personal choice, particularly if you're pregnant or breastfeeding um, or you know, making formula from water from your tap. Um, people you know, can make a personal choice to go the limit and put in a filtration system. Um, in order to help inform everybody about um, what is available, there, we have a tip sheet. Make sure you take this handout because um, our researcher uh, and scientific analyst, um, Matt McCann, who's out, out front there and greeted you when you came in, he did this research um, in order to find out what are today, what are the filtration systems that remove PFAS? And so there's a lot of good information here with links um, you can you know, delve into further. Also, we, we found the most recent analysis of bottled water 
because that's a, not a, a lot of things that people do too. Um, they'll drink bottled water and maybe they'll cook with water from their tap, particularly if they have a baby they're making formula for. But remember, bottled water does not have to meet the same safe drinking water standards as tap water. And it's in plastic, so you can get leaching of plastic into water. However, we did research it, and sometimes you must drink water from a bottle. Um, and if you do, it's important to know what's in that water. So we actually have some water bottles, if anyone's, I mean, bottles of water, even though we usually don't provide them, but we did it because it was so hot, and we bought one of the ones that's called Purified Water, and it is certified to be free of PFAS and arsenic. So um, they're out there, and Matt tried to put them on some ice, so please, if you didn't bring your own water, uh, help yourself. But this has good information in here, and um, it is the most recent that we could find. And then also, um, we have on the back of this uh, more links. But uh, so, that I wanted to address that just to make sure that everybody knew that there are home treatment systems. Okay, where is well number three? I think maybe that's a question for Bill. Uh, we, we don't have a well number three. Our, our two wells in Sewell are 1A and 2A. Our uh, well in uh, Railroad Avenue is nine, and those are the three that are in the lower um, PRM. And the other two wells are seven and eight that are located at Red Bank, and those were the two that have become. I thought uh, I read where well three was closed. Well, Can I answer that question? I sure. think that's West Effort that you're talking about. Oh, okay. West, right. uh, it is. Maryland. It is. Uh, there was a presentation from Solvay uh, representatives uh, a few weeks ago to the Environmental Commission of West Effort, and they said at that meeting that Well 3 is closed right now right. for remediation. Mm -hmm. Is that closed Oh, you're talking about West Effort. West Effort. Not I don't know where it is. Okay. I don't either. There were two in West Effort, and, but now it's just... The other one was three. 8. Yeah. 8 was closed. Right. Well 8 was closed for five or six years, from what I understand, because I asked that question how long it took him to remediate it. And then he did say that, I think, well, three is closed now. So, you know, apparently from what I understand, and just one more comment, is that the, the township itself is the one, are the people who uh, test the water. And if they find something in it, uh, then they tell Solvay, and Solvay comes in as far as, you know, the West Effort wells. That's, that's all I know about that one. Yeah, and um, as far as distance, and. Um, we can't really answer those questions, the distance of the contamination from the well. That's actually still being analyzed. And some towns, uh, the, municipal, uh, the municipal authorities um, and, the, and the township committees are just up to here with trying to get this information. And there have been lawsuits that have been filed by uh, some of the towns in this area in order to be able to try to get Solvay to not only pay for this, but also tell them some of the answers to these questions, like how close is the contamination to that well. Um, so I think if we answer the question about what's being done to correct it um, for the original PFAS compounds. Um, we need to engage our township committees. We need to engage, engage our city councils. And they were instrumental in getting New Jersey to act in the first place when this was first discovered in 2013. So um, in this area. So it's very important that we bring these up and that you, you bring up the information that you find, for instance, in your bill or from what we're talking about here tonight, looking at these links. Um, did Solvay pay for any of the Woodbury remediation? Ultimately, they pay for uh, taking a bunch of samples, um, Thank you. but they have not paid anything for the Woodbury remediation. After a lot of back and forth, they basically said, um, we're done. It's in the river or in Woodbury Creek or from some other source, and um, we're not doing anything more for you, So, um, which we disagree with entirely. So, um, you know, I, I think it remains to be seen what happens with Solvay. We're uh, in the process of entertaining uh, hiring a special counsel to, to deal with that issue. Um, but we wanted to get the water supply up and operational first and then come back. And we also wanted to let DEP and Solvay spend some time and money doing further evaluation of where the problem lies. So 
But it's close. Very close. So one of the things that really got things moving um, in, back in 2013 is because the borough of Paulsboro had the highest level of any, any uh, town well for PFNA, um, they sent a notice of intent to sue uh, pretty immediately to Solvay. And the result was that Solvay ponied up the money and put in their filtration system for them. So um, many towns now, because of the system that's been set up by New Jersey, are trying to get the money through the infrastructure trust program uh, and the spill program. But money that is spent by a municipality is possible to be reimbursed through the spill program. And that's at, under the New Jersey Spill Act, which requires polluters that are found to be uh, responsible to pay money into that fund. So um, there is a source, there, and hopefully um, their feet will continue to be put to the fire. Um, so somebody asked a question about the South Jersey Times. Probably the best newspaper coverage has been the New Jersey Spotlight. Um, which really does have pretty, you know, the, the reporter there really follows everything pretty closely. It's kind of odd, but the South Jersey Times just doesn't seem to want to cover this issue. Or when they do, they, they just don't have, they don't do very good stories. They have misinformation. I've had to call them and correct things. Um, so I think really the way to get more uh, media attention is through these public meetings that, that are coming up through people speaking up at public meetings. Um, you know, a reporter's gonna come out if there's a formal public meeting. And it's really hard to get them to cover a story unless there's a news hook. And that's a news hook. And we can use it to our advantage. Uh, another question, and we only have... Um, I have one thing yeah. before you go to the next question. If anybody doesn't know New Jersey Spotlight, it's online. Um, it's not like a newspaper that you hold in your hand and read. So. Um, as far as I know. So go, go on your computer and just Google NJ Spotlight and it'll come up. Thank you, Jean. Uh, so we only have about uh, 10 more minutes, so because we have to be totally out of here by 8. Uh, I saw a hand over here, um, and then I'm going to go to these other, other couple questions. Go ahead, sir. Yes, Christopher Zella. I wonder if you're familiar with the DuPont case in the town, I think it was West Virginia, yes. and they made a movie out of it yes. uh, called The River. That went nationwide. Yes. And they paid out a lot of money. Yes. Yeah, that was the original that was the original discovery that I mentioned earlier in West Virginia. And Rob Ballot, the attorney there, exposed this. There was a big article up in the New York Times about him going up against this giant international firm, DuPont. And um, as a result of that, um, you know, hundreds of thousands of people were affected. And um, that's where that blood study that I said, that study that shows uh, human health impacts from PFOA, that's where it was 70,000 people's blood was tested. And they found, they correlated that through doing health studies, um, epidemiological studies, to link it to diseases. And that's in that handout here. Right. Why would you say as a filmmaker things. you might want to show that film because it brings the issue yes, out? No. Right now, it seems pretty dead to me. Yes, the, 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 film, the film is uh, Dark Waters. It stars Mark Ruffalo. We did show it already last year. Um, they let you, they have distribution rights and all this stuff, and every so often you get to use it. Um, but we, yeah, that's a good suggestion. Also, um, Exposure is a book by Rob Ballot, that attorney, and it is a page turner. It's a documentary book. It's a story about how he discovered that and what he went through. And I'll tell you, you sit down and read that, you'll sit, go through it in one night. It's fantastic. And that's what they based the movie on. So, okay, so, yes, absolutely. Um, so, was a representative from West Deptford Township invited to this meeting? No, we didn't really give formal um, invitations to, this is really for the public to learn about stuff, um, and certainly we did send, because we were in Woodbury, uh, we sent uh, to our mailing list, which Bill Fleming is on that mailing list, the mayor is on the mailing list, so we did send notice of this out. Um, but certainly one of the things that we would like to do is have meetings in every one of these towns 
West Deptford, Paulsboro, Greenwich Township, and East Greenwich Township. So, um, and we will invite them to come, uh, certainly. They have been instrumental in addressing the problem. We hope they would continue to be. I, I, did, yes, I did tell them about it. Uh, yes, uh, West Deptford, uh, I'm on the Environmental Commission, by the way. And uh, they've been hearing a lot about this from various people. We've even had Sol Bay come in to talk to us. And, uh, um, and so the Township Committee has, knows all about this program because I've been telling everybody about it. But uh, believe it, it's, it's on their radar for sure. Great. Okay, we have one more question. And um, it's a good one because th I was going to close with calling your attention to this PFAS health study. So one of the things that has come out of this whole fiasco with Solvay is a health study is being done based on samples taken from people's blood in Paulsboro. Now they also include some people in West Deptford, but those are the only communities that are included at this time. We're ho this is being funded by the federal government, the Centers for Disease Control. They have an office set up, and they just began sampling last week. And they are going to be open up uh, on a regular basis in September, but they're having special days where they're opening now. And they need to get hundreds of um, people to volunteer for this, but you need to meet certain requirements in terms of when you were living in Paulsboro, West Deptford, and where you were getting your water supply. So um, please take this, and there's extra copies out there too. If you know anybody who lives in Paulsboro or West Deptford, please take them because we want people to know about this. The only way to know if your health has been impacted is by sampling your blood because then they can find out what the level is in your blood. And they have studies so they know if it reaches certain levels, particularly in certain people, then you're more likely to develop a disease that's linked to the PFAS exposure. Okay? So testing your blood is the only way to find out. And if you go to your regular physician and ask for that test, they're not going to know what you're talking about. It's a very special test. It needs to be done in a special lab. They know how to do it. They're doing it in Paulsboro. We are advocating that more of these be done in other communities as well, because people want to know, is it in my blood? Do I have a higher risk of developing a disease? And you only know that by testing the human body. Eventually, your, the human body does excrete it, but it takes many years. So while you continue to drink water that's contaminated, it's continuing to build up. And that's when you want to test and find out if you've had that high level of exposure. OK, so um, the last question is about that. And then also, um, if a municipality received a settlement, does that mean you can't get any more money? So I'm not a lawyer. I can't really answer that. But one thing I do know is not necessarily. And one of the reasons for that is because what about the replacement compound? They settled back when they knew about PFNA. The town didn't know about the replacement compound back then. And the town doesn't know about the replacement for the replacement. So come on. There's a whole new round of harm. And it needs to be accounted for by those who are responsible. So Sylvain is going to have to step up. And I'm not, like I said, I'm not an attorney. And it depends on what the settlement agreement was. But the bottom line is that common sense, it seems like Solve has a lot more to pay now that more has come out about what they've actually done in this community. Okay, so I think we got all the questions, and I really appreciate everyone coming out. Bill, yes? Just, just one more thing. I, I went online today to um, look at what I could find on PFAS, and I noticed that there is, and I've been reading about this over the last couple of months, there is legislation pending at the federal level yes. for the Forever Chemicals Act that the House has passed, and it's now uh, before the Senate, and it would uh, make PFAS chemicals um, circle eligible and include those contaminated sites as yes. part of Superfund, and it would bring the power of the federal government to bear not just the state of New Jersey, but the power of the federal government 
which yeah. since we're dealing with an interstate water like the Delaware River, would be really important. And there's also, as far as liability is concerned under CERCLA, much stronger teeth than what we may have here in New Jersey. So yeah, thank you, Bill. Our yes. congressman, I'm, I'm sure, supported it um, yes. from this area. And I'm sure our senators will, too, um, in the Senate. But it's, it's the, those other senators and other states that we really want to get to if we have that ability. That's part of the problem. Um, and under the last, uh, the, under the Trump administration, everything died. There were, n none of that legislation moved ahead. It's actually been out there for several years. But under the new administration, they've made a pledge that they're going to do everything they can. So there is action actually occurring. Um, with uh, several pieces of legislation having to do with naming it as a hazardous substance, um, upping the requirements for those who are responsible for the, pollu for the pollution, um, and for establishing a federal safe drinking water standard for these PFAS compounds, which doesn't exist today. Um, there are eight states that have adopted mandatory standards. New Jersey was the first. Um, but everybody deserves to have safe water. And if you live in a state that your state is not taking any action, it's just not fair. That kind of injustice can only be undone by federal standards. So we do support that. So thanks for bringing it up. Thank you for coming out tonight. Um, and thank you again, Dietrich Preston. We greatly appreciate the support of the Woodbury Friends Meeting House. And, um, if anybody wants to just chat a little bit outside, we do have to be outside uh, because we're closing up. But we'll, we'll you know, talk a little bit. Um, Jim, uh, Jean, and Marilyn, um, anyone else who wants to chat a little bit um, right outside after we close up, go right ahead. Make sure you take plenty of handouts. You can share them with your neighbors. Thank you all for coming out tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.